God has blessed me with a beautiful wife. And I would not be able to do what I do without her help. And I appreciate her so much. Um, and then our three wonderful children, uh, Champion, Emmett, and Autumn. And uh, we are on dedication right now, uh, going to the mission field in Thailand. And uh, we are sent out of our home church at First Baptist in Seymour, Iowa. And uh, that is the church that I've had the privilege of growing up in and, and uh, being saved in, serving with, and now being sent out of uh, that church as a missionary. Um, just a privilege uh, for me to have that as my home and sending church. Um, Iowa, if you, if, even if you do find the state of Iowa, you're not going to find Seymour unless you're intentionally looking for it. Um, you go to Seymour to see less. There's not much there. Um, there's no restaurants. There's no stoplights. Very small town, um, but just a wonderful church there. Uh, that I, as I said, I've had the privilege of, of being with, uh, in that church for many years. And I mentioned that I grew up in the church there and uh, was, grew up in a good Christian home. Um, and God showed me uh, mercy and grace and love for many days. Um, I didn't get saved until I was 19 years old. I made a false profession when I was younger. And uh, I noticed in our church there in Iowa that people were getting saved. And every time somebody got saved, everybody got excited. And uh, the church was uh, so excited to see someone get saved, which is the way it should be. That's right. Um, it's the greatest thing that can happen in an individual's life. Uh, but as a young boy, as a little sinner, um, I saw a way to manipulate that for my own good. And I thought, hey, you know, they, I won't be able to get excited about me. So, yeah, I'll pray a prayer and I'll tell people I got saved. And that's what I did at a young, at a young age and um, continued to live that lie of, yes, I'm saved. And would tell that to myself and tell that to others. And it doesn't matter what lie you tell. Uh, if you tell a lie long enough, over and over again, all it does is bring confusion. That's right. And when well, I got in my teen years, um, I was experiencing the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And yet, as I lied to myself for years and years, uh, I was so confused as a teenager. And wondering, okay, is this truly the conviction of the Holy Spirit, or is this Satan wanting me to doubt? And uh, very confused and most of the time, I'll be honest, I hate to say it, but usually I would just brush it off and, you know, say, oh, you know, I'm saved, I, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And at 19 years old, after going to Bible college as a, for one year as a lost man, um, at 19 years old, God got a hold of my heart mm -hmm. and showed me that I never truly had accepted him as my personal Savior. And I listened to a message called Examine Yourself Through Scripture, whether you be in the faith or not. And what I realized what I was doing was I was doing what actually millions of people around the world do every day. Mm -hmm. Is I was looking at myself sure. and saying I must be saved because I'm doing this. I must be saved because I'm not doing this. And I'm, I'm going here but I'm not going there. Every time the Holy Spirit would come and, and convict me of my salvation, my go-to was not I trusted in Christ. I know I'm saved. No, it was, well, I do all these things. Yeah, right. And the Holy Spirit got a hold of my heart at 19 years old and said, you are a religious hypocrite. Sure. You are a Pharisee. You're, you're, you're exactly the type of person that Jesus condemned while he was here on this earth of yeah. looking the right way and doing the right things. But inwardly, I, 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 I'm, I'm as dirty as a sepulcher, as, as dirty as a, as, a, as a tombstone. And so... God really got a hold of my heart and showed me that I was lost. And I'm so thankful, as I said, that he showed me so much mercy and grace for all those years. And at 19 years old, he saved my soul. And I just praise him for that. And it wasn't very long after that that I felt the Lord calling me to the ministry, calling me to preach. And uh, I wasn't quite sure what that was going to look like. I didn't know uh, where God was going to lead me, what he was going to call me into. Um... I just knew I was called to preach and called to serve him with my life. And so I was serving there at my church in Iowa. And before my wife and I got married, she was, her and I were talking. And she knew that God had called me to the ministry. And she wanted to know if I had any idea of what those specifics were uh, as we were talking and courting. And I shared with her that at that time, uh, in my, uh, after I got saved, after God called me, 
I had a burden for the people of Iowa. I wanted a pastor there. I wanted maybe even start a church in Iowa. That's what I wanted to do. And I was praying that God might open that door. And I told my wife, I said, that's my burden. That's what I would like to do. And I told her, I said, I could see maybe evangelism or youth ministries or just a few other things. But I, I told her this. I said, definitely not missions. <laughs> and you never say those words. You never say definitely not and then finish that phrase. Because what I've come to find out is that most of the time, when somebody uses that phrase, something similar to it, that's exactly what God calls them into. And I realize that's not the case for everyone, but for the majority, I've come to find that that's, that's true. Yeah. God likes to put us out, take us out of our comfort zone. Yes, sir. He likes to take us and uh, lead us to that place where we said, no, God, uh, I don't, I, I, I'll give you all of this, but this I'm not. But God wants it all. God wants us to yield everything to him. There was one area of ministry um, that at that time, I, and I'll be honest, I, I don't even remember thinking, you know, I don't want to do missions at all. It was just, I did not think that that was ever going to be the case for me. I never saw myself as a missionary or a missionary material. And I thought, why would God call me to the mission field? I've grown up in a small town, country boy from Iowa. You know, the population of the city, of the town where my church is, is 500, 600 people. And God, yet God wants me to go to a country where the capital city has 10 million people. And that just doesn't make sense to me. But God began to work on my heart about Thailand when he brought a missionary to our church in Iowa going to Thailand. And I'll be honest, before that missionary came through, I don't even remember if I ever heard about the country of Thailand. Uh, I, don't, I, I can honestly say I never remember meeting another missionary going to Thailand. And so uh, this was somewhat new, a new uh, country, a new culture, learning about it. Right. But it was more than that. Um, our church, I'm thankful, is very missions-minded. And we have missionaries in throughout the year and support many missionaries, pray for many missionaries, and I'm thankful for that. But there was something different about Thailand uh, when this missionary came through. He went on and going on the deputation trail and going to different churches. There was something different about the Thai people. And I'll be honest, initially I wasn't quite sure what it was. And I, I kind of tried to coax my way out of it and say, well, God, maybe God just wants me to pray more for this missionary. Pray more for the Thai people. And God, you know, let me know that, well, that's great. You can pray for them more, but there's it's more personal than that. And God began to work in my heart personally about going to this country of Thailand. And just like Moses at the burning bush, I, I fought God on it for a little bit and told God reasons why I couldn't go and reasons why it didn't make sense. And yeah. I don't know if you ever had an argument with God, but you can't win those. And God got a hold of my heart and showed me that if I stayed in Iowa, and even if I pastored and I did all these other things, what some people might think are honorable and great and way to go, I wouldn't have been where God wanted me. Right. And that really, really got my attention. Yeah. God began to uh, confirm it to my heart. But that's where he wanted my family and I to go. I shared this with my wife after a few months of fasting and praying over it and wanting to be sure. And um, When I shared it with her, I wanted her to be just as certain as I was that this is where God wanted us to go. And it wasn't too much later, after I shared with her a couple of months later, uh, another missionary uh, came to our church. He was going to the, he was, he'd been in the Philippines for a number of years. And before he got finished with his message and his, and his update, uh, my wife and I looked at each other and we said, we have to go. We know that this is what God wants from us. We have to go. And we surrendered that night to go to the country of Thailand. Uh, of course, with COVID and other things, right. that got pushed back a little bit. But uh, in the uh, summer of 2021, uh, Thailand still was very much uh, locked down. Um, but uh, churches here were starting to open up a little bit more. And the COVID here in America wasn't quite as back and forth as it was the year before. And my wife and I have been praying about what to do. And I, I felt very strongly that rather than do what we had originally planned, what most missionaries do as far as going on a survey trip and then coming back and starting uh, their deputation, 
Uh, we, were, we weren't content with just sitting back and waiting for Thailand to open up. We wanted to get started. We wanted to get to do what we could here uh, stateside. And so middle of 2021, we started uh, deputation part-time while I worked a job there in Iowa. And um, God just blessed the first few months there, just uh, slowly getting into churches and uh, getting some support there. And then in February of last year, we started full-time. And um, right after we started full-time, uh, we were given the opportunity. God opened up a window of about three and a half weeks uh, to, for us to go to Thailand. And uh, it was just a wonderful way by which God worked there uh, with the whole COVID uh, restrictions that they had and then opening it up for us in that moment. Uh, that, that window that we had was just an amazing way that God worked. But we were able to fly over to Thailand and we were able to visit uh, three or four different missionaries there, in different areas of Thailand. Uh, we didn't want to be focused just on one area. We wanted to see as much of the country as we could and get an idea of maybe a, a region that God would want us to, to begin in and, and, and work with. And so we, we flew in and, and very, I mean, if you've ever been out of the country, uh, you know, out of, out of this country to go visit another country, I'm sure it's the same case anywhere and everywhere other country we go, but very, very different uh, culture, very different uh, atmosphere, and, and just, uh, you can tell it felt like you were in another world. And one of the main reasons why Thailand was so different uh, was their, their false religion of Buddhism. Their religion of Buddhism is, I, I truly believe it's more than just a false religion. It's a part of their life. It's a way of society. Yeah. Um, everywhere we went, we whether we were in the capital city or the, in another big city, or we were in a little village, or we were in the middle of the country, uh, we would see giant statues, giant idols of Buddha, false temples of Buddha. We have a miniature model of a spirit house on our uh, display back there. Um, those are that's about four or five times smaller than the actual spirit house, but you'll see those outside of every home or business in Thailand. And what those are is they will put those out and they'll put food and drinks out to those spirit houses to please the spirits or appease the, the evil spirits. And so that they will be given good luck on their properties. And so all in, in many different areas of life, business, family life, you name it, the false religion of Buddhism is integrated into much of it. And so it was, it was very clear that they took their religion uh, very seriously. But in fact, one of the written laws in Thailand is that every male, every every young boy, before he reaches the age of 16, must go to a Buddhist temple for a year and learn the ways of a Buddhist monk. And so many people there, even if they may not uh, practice Buddhism uh, extensively and, and cost, uh, faithfully go to the temple, uh, many of the men at least have a very strong mindset and understanding of what the Buddhist faith is. And uh, most of them count that as a privilege, as an honor, and faithfully commit to that and to follow through with that. And so Buddhism is just like almost any other false religion. Uh, and it's, any, it's like any other false religion that I know uh, where it's very much so works-based salvation. And we've been asked, one of the main questions that my wife and I get asked uh, in, while we're in churches is, what are the what, what is the greatest hindrance uh, to what we plan on doing there in Thailand, sharing the gospel? What are some oppositions that we face? It's not government oppression. Thailand is very open and free to the gospel. In fact, uh, Thailand is very a very unique country in Southeast Asia where it's located. Uh, most of the, the countries that neighbor it are very communist, anti-God, and so in fact most. Uh, missionaries that are going to those neighboring countries use Thailand as a means to get into those countries. And so Thailand right now, we're blessed that it is open and free for us to go and share the gospel with the people. It's not uh, the, the greatest uh, hindrance to the gospel in Thailand is also it's not uh, the citizens of uh, the country and dealing with persecution from them. The Thai people are very open to the gospel. 
They're very interested in, in another, and in, in, they're just very interested in religions. They're very superstitious. And so it is very easy for us to start a conversation with a Thai person about our, our Christianity, about the gospel. And, but the, so the greatest opposition, the greatest hindrance to the gospel, I believe, is, is two things. Number one, it is the false religion of Buddhism, but it is also the ignorance of the people. And what I mean by that is these people, like I said, are very interested about other religions. But as, a miss as missionaries over there, what we need to be very careful of is these people will very readily take what we are saying and what we are preaching and teaching and take the God of the Bible and Jesus and add, add them to what they already believe. And they will make a Christianity, true Christianity, part of their Buddhism. And we've been told, my wife and I have been told by other missionaries and even other uh, people uh, that we've met on deputation, some that were stationed in the military in Thailand, they have told us that they have seen uh, Buddhist temples and Buddhist altars where there were candles and different miniature Buddha idols and all these things, but there was also gospel tracts or things pertaining to the Christian faith on those altars. And what has happened in that moment is a Thai person, a Thai Buddhist, has unfortunately taken the truth and just added it to what they believe and what their false religion is. And that's unfortunate. That is something that we have to be very careful about in sharing the gospel with them is that this isn't just another way, this isn't just another God, but that he is the one and only. And that they can't just add them to their Buddhism, but they need to turn from their Buddhism to the risen Savior, to the only one that can save right. Buddhism teaches them that if they do enough good works, if their good outweighs their bad, yeah. then, then they might make it. Mm -hmm. And then they also incorporate reincarnation mm -hmm. and teach them if you do enough good things over enough lifetimes, uh, then after a few lifetime cycles, you might just make it to nirvana or enlightenment is, is you know, basically what that means. And you, you might say, well, what, what's that? Is that like their version of heaven? Or Basically what that is is they cease to exist as a person and they become their own little God. Now, folks, that's no hope. Right. Number one, it's no hope because it's not true. But also it's no hope because... I truly believe that if every person is honest with themselves, whether it's you and I or if it's a person in Thailand, if every person is honest with themselves, we know that our good can never outweigh our bad. That's right. We're born sinners. We can't earn our way to heaven, much less the real one, let alone a fake one. Come on. And so this is, these people are given a false hope. And they live in fear of the unknown, of, of eternity, knowing that they are given no hope. It's been said that the original Buddha who lived thousands of years ago, was lying on his deathbed. And as he was about to pass from this earth, he looked to his followers. And he told them, he said, strive unceasingly. In other words, he told them to do more, be better, work harder. And unfortunately, that's still the teaching of Buddhism today. But we know in our scriptures, especially and specifically in the Gospels, as our Savior hung and died on Calvary at the cross, he did not look to his followers and cry out, strive unceasingly. He, look, he cried out, it is finished. Yeah. Because we don't have to work hard. We don't have to do more. We don't have to be better to earn our salvation. We cannot do that. It's already been paid for. Yeah. It is finished. Yeah. Christ has paid our penalty for sin yeah. at Calvary. Paid in full. Yes, sir. And I'm thankful that you and I, I hope, I pray that you uh, and I both know that and have that settled, but many people do not. That's true. Yeah. And unfortunately, I mentioned the ignorance of the people. Sometimes the ignorance is to the extreme of the fact that they've never heard the name Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. They've never heard the idea that there's only one God. To tell a Thai Buddhist that there's only one God that might be, that might be something they've never heard before. There are many over there who've never read one verse of scripture. Wow. When we were in Thailand, one of the missionaries was showing us around 
And he showed, he showed, he shared with my wife and I. He said, you know, a couple of weeks before you both got here, he said I was in a uh, market looking for some shoes. And he said I noticed there were these shoes over over uh, in this area. And he said they had a Bible reference from Proverbs written on the shoe. He said I've never seen that before. He said I have no idea what kind of shoe it was, but it got his attention. And he thought, wow, this is great. This is amazing. What an open door, what an opportunity. And he went and he found the person that was working the market and he brought her over and he said, do you see that? And she said, yeah. He said, he said, do you know what that is? And she said, no. He said, well, that's a Bible reference. It's a verse from the Bible. And she looked at him and she said, what is a Bible? Oh, wow. And he said, what I was hoping was going to be an open door to witness. And it still could be. But in that moment, at that time, all it really was was just an introduction to truth. And an, an introduction to Christianity, to true Christianity, to the gospel. And folks, it's unfortunate, but it is true that there are many in Thailand that if my wife and I are another missionary, or if you were to visit Thailand, if you were to go up to them and say, have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Or do you know for sure that you're going to heaven when you die? Or, you know, what, however you might ask that question here, and, and as, you sold, as you knock doors and witness to others, the Thai person might look at you like, what are you talking about? They've never heard this before. They have no idea. Wow. So what I usually say is, can a Thai Buddhist be saved the first time they hear the gospel? Absolutely. The gospel is powerful. The Holy Spirit can work in ways that you and I cannot explain right. many times. Right. Yes, it is possible. But the majority of the time, that is not the case. Mm -hmm. The majority of the time, it is just faithful teaching of what the Bible says. Faithful teaching of who God is and what sin is and why they need to be saved. Mm -hmm. Why Jesus came. I compare it many times, and I mean this in no, no disrespect to the Thai people whatsoever, but I compare it many times to my wife and I teaching our children. My children, our children were not born with the knowledge of who God is. They weren't born with the knowledge of what sin is. They, they, were, they were born with sin, but they weren't born with the knowledge of what sin was. Mm -hmm. They weren't born with the knowledge of why Jesus came or who Jesus was. And so we needed to teach them those things over the last five years or so. And that is the way it is with people who they may be in their mid, you know, mid thirties, forties, fifties, or older. Mm -hmm. But if they've never heard the gospel, right. it takes faithful teaching yeah. yes, sir. of what the Bible says. Yes, sir. And I'm thankful for that because while I, I, I you know, I don't choose to, uh, I, I would never choose for someone to go that long without ever hearing the gospel. But number one, it is amazing to be able to share that with someone for the first time. Amen. Amen. But also, I'm thankful that I don't have to rely on my knowledge. I don't have to rely on my words and what I'm doing and what I'm saying. I just have to faithfully teach them what the Bible says. Amen. And this is what I'm going to teach. This is what I'm going to share with them. This is what I want them to put their trust in. And so I'm thankful that I can do that with the Word of God. But our, God has called us to go to Thailand, I believe, for three uh, main purposes. Number one, that is to obviously share the gospel. We've talked about that already. But that is the main reason why God would have to go is to share the gospel, tell others about Jesus and about the salvation that they need. But I truly believe that if we went over to Thailand, and that's all we did, all we did was share the gospel and lead people to Christ and then go on our way and all that, and that's all we ever did. I don't believe that we would truly be carrying out the Great Commission of the Because Jesus, he commanded us to, yes, to teach them and to, to preach the gospel, but he also told us to baptize and to teach them in all things whatsoever he's commanded us. That's right. That's and so we are to baptize and disciple, yeah. and I believe, plant churches. And I believe that is the ministry that God has called my family and I to is yes to share the gospel, yes to preach Jesus, but not to stop there. That we would start churches, that we would plant a church where these people that have trusted in Christ, they turn from Buddhism, they turn to Christ, they can come and they can worship the true God. Yeah. They can hear the true word of God preached. 
And they can strive towards winning others to Christ. Mm -hmm. They can go out in their communities and yeah. bring others to the church and share the gospel with them. That is what we believe God would have us to do. And thirdly, the reason that we believe God would have us to go is to disciple those new, new believers. But also as God provides and leads that we might have some pastors there in Thailand that God would, uh, that God would uh, lead them to us. They would be saved, baptized, and discipled. And then God would, would train them up uh, under our ministry that they would take over those Thai churches and uh, pastor them much better than my wife and I ever could. And so they would take over those churches and we would go on and to another area of Thailand and start over and uh, begin to start a new church where God leads us. And so that is why we believe God has called us to Thailand is to, to do those three things. Start, uh, uh, share the gospel, start churches, and disciple new believers and train them. And so we do ask if you would to please pray for us. Uh, we have our prayer cards on the table back there. Please take one of these and, and keep them where uh, you will regularly see it. And uh, please keep us in your prayers. We definitely appreciate that. Uh, that is the greatest thing that you can do for my family and I is to pray for us. And so we appreciate that. Uh, at this time, if you have your Bibles, I have turn with me in Genesis. Genesis chapter 45. Pastor, thank you, church, for allowing our family to come here tonight and Amen. introduce our ministry and share a message with you all. I sure appreciate that. Our deal downstairs before uh, service, very good. And just thank you for that. It's been a blessing to get to know your pastor and his family a little bit more. It's been a blessing to meet you all this evening. Been looking forward to, to being here with you all this evening. Amen. Genesis chapter 45. We'll begin reading in verse 1. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him and cried, cause every man to go out from him. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he left aloud the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am Joseph, if my father yet lived. And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said to his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For God had sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years have the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be eating nor harvest. And God sent me before you to reserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God, and he had made me a father of Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. One thing that has been commonly taught and discussed over uh, the thousands of years that we've had the book of Genesis, um, and the church age especially, as people have studied the word of God and looked through the Old Testament, one thing that has been uh, discussed and taught many times, and you may have heard this uh, teaching, I've, I've, I've heard this uh, teaching a number of times, but that we, in the Old Testament, there are what we would consider uh, types of Christ, or pictures of Christ, the coming Messiah, the Son of God. There are pictures throughout the Old Testament, and uh, I believe that that is biblical, I believe that's accurate. Uh, for one thing, when Jesus rose from the dead, and he, he met with those two disciples on the road to Emmaus, it says that he showed with them uh, who he was in the Old Testament. It says he showed them through the law and the prophets and the Psalms. And so, no doubt, there are pictures and there are types of, the, of Christ in the Old Testament. And it's been said that one of those, maybe the uh, greatest uh, type of Christ in the Old Testament, is this man named Joseph. Now, we don't have time this evening to look at the life of Joseph in full and look at all the ways that uh, he has uh, pictures in his life that relate to the coming Messiah, that relate to uh, Jesus Christ. But here in just this text, I believe that we see enough that it's, it's evident.